Hi, and welcome to the Storytellers Project. My name is Megan Finnerty, and I am so excited to be here with you tonight. I'm coming for, to you, as you can see, from my show here in Phoenix, and we appreciate you taking a chance on live storytelling this evening. I'm here on behalf of the USA Today Network, welcoming you to the Storytellers Project show on resiliency. We are excited to be in your living rooms because since 2016, we have been bringing shows across America in 22 cities, more than 100 shows a year all across the country. But to be honest, we've postponed literally all of the shows for the rest of the season because it still feels unsafe in most communities to gather in large groups indoors. So instead, we are bringing you the very best stories from our last several years, more than a thousand that have been told. Tonight, five everyday people are going to tell stories from their own homes. They're gonna be charming, they're gonna be funny, they're gonna be relatable, they're gonna be touching. And most of all, they're going to be entertaining. So tonight, I want you to say hello to our first storytellers. I'm going to bring them up so you can say hello. Ryan Kitchell is here. Brad hello. Schmidt is here. Hi, Ryan. Jack Flores. Joy Young. And Manny Sepulveda. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. Thank you. Tonight is not a TED Talk. It's not a Toastmasters. It's not a how-to, an inspirational speech, an educational lecture. There's no slideshows behind me. No, instead, this is about visiting. The whole idea is that we want you to open your hearts and we want you to open your minds. We want you to receive these stories in the spirit in which they're intended because that's how community connecting really happens. We want you to feel closer to people, even if they're strangers still inside their own houses. Some of these stories are gonna be casual and conversational. Some are gonna be really polished and professional. We hope that you receive them all and see yourself reflected in them in some small way. Tonight's stories, like I said, are about resiliency in all of its forms. We got bounce backs, recoveries, getting back up, literally and metaphorically. And right now it feels like a really good time to affirm our strength and our grace as individuals and as a nation. We're a resilient people. And we hope that you feel like by watching this together, listening to these people share their stories, you're more connected to your own resiliency. The Storytellers Project and USA Today is committed to the idea that it is vital to create empathy and understanding in times of uncertainty. And of course, always. So you guys, I'm excited to welcome. Also, I'm from Indiana. You guys is a gender neutral term. We don't have y'all up north. So instead, I will say, everyone, I'm excited to bring up our very first storyteller, Ryan Kitchell. Hi, Megan. How are you? Hi, Ryan. Take it away. Okay. Um, so I went to a uh, Texas high school and I played baseball. And as I was graduating, there weren't any colleges that were tearing my door down to play for him. So I decided to become a military photographer. I heard you could do that. And I had a passion for photography and I kind of reluctantly went to a recruiter to find out more information. And he's like, uh, Hey, listen, you're going to meet the best people of your life, kid. You're going to travel the world and free ice cream, free donuts, free coffee. And I was like, all right, I'm in. So, um, I went to boot camp and then photography school in Baltimore. And I got assigned to a, um, a ship on the West Coast, and I was really excited. And my first few gigs were lame, like award ceremonies, but I guess I did good enough that they decided to give me my first overseas assignment, which was really exciting. And they were sending me to East Timor, which I hadn't heard of the country before. Uh, apparently, a civil war had just taken place, and they flew me in immediately to document what had happened. And as the helicopter's landing, I could see smoke still coming from the buildings. And so we got on the ground and I'm, t you know, just documenting what I'm seeing and I'm stepping over dead bodies as a 19 year old. And I remember thinking like, why the hell is this my job? And at one point I stepped on a detached ear, which I had to scrape off of my boot and I vomited. And this guy comes up to me and he goes, he's like, Hey man, I see, I see what's going on. You need to take all this, stuff that you're seeing and doing and you put it in a shoebox and close the lid and put it in the back of your head and you need to do your job and i literally envisioned that and i did my job and then as i flew away um i just remember sort of like leaving my belief in god right there on that island i was like i don't know how that could be a thing and then a couple of years later 9 11 happened and my job then changed again um not everything i did was scary and bad i did a lot of fun stuff that i'm grateful for but there were some dangerous scary times that i had to photograph and about a couple years later i'm about to get out my five years is almost up and there's no way i'm staying in no way on earth and something was wrong with me i, I didn't know what but i didn't feel anything inside i felt not in, I, not dead inside like people say i felt nothing and it was sort of scary and one of the last days before i got out i 
I put a gun in my mouth and looked at myself in the bathroom mirror. And in that moment, I mean, I didn't want to die. I don't know what I was doing, but I felt something and it terrified me. And a couple days later, I'm driving a U-Haul to Phoenix to go be with my dad. And I remember looking in the rearview mirror and seeing the San Diego skyline disappearing. And I was like so grateful to be alive and, and looking forward to the future. And I remember thinking now that all the bad things are behind me and I've never been more wrong in my life about that. Um, it's like the nightmare started immediately. That shoebox opened and I, I was seeing the dead bodies I had to photograph like attacking me. And I felt a lot of guilt and I was so smart. I thought um, I found that the right amount of whiskey at night, I wouldn't have those nightmares. I'm like, man, I got this. I'm a genius, man. And um Turns out, I found out later, that's called self-medicating because there is no right amount, whatever drug you choose. You always have to take more and more and more and more. So fast forward, like 13 years later, I'm still doing that. And at this point, I'm buying the 1.75 liters uh, of whiskey every single day. Sometimes I would buy four or five just to have a business week I could get through. And it was just getting out of control, but I didn't realize it. And then... Um, things in my life started spiraling, like relationships weren't going well at work. I was getting, I lost my job. I was losing my freaking house, my first house I ever bought. And I was just depressed and, and nonstop self-medicating with whiskey. And um, I received word that a friend of mine hanged himself, um, who I served with. And that night I drank so much. Um, I was surprised I woke up the next morning. Um, I stumbled over to my soon to be foreclosed upon bathroom mirror and just i made eye contact with myself and i was like oh my god you're killing yourself and you're doing it slowly and i, I don't want that so I, then i decided to get help and thankfully for me my insurance is through the va so i'm <laughs> oh goodness um it took about three months to even get my first appointment and that's with daily phone calls and when i got my first one i was so excited and the the this is the, I think he was a psychiatrist or a psychologist. He was more drunk than I was. And I left and I demanded a second one. And this guy, I guess he'd heard that I said no to the first one. He's like, I'm not even talking to you unless you get on these 11 medications. And I know that works for some people, but that's not the path I want to take in life. And they gave me the third one and they're like, um, you know, this is your last shot, kid. That's all we got. Same voice as a recruiter somehow. Um, and she wanted to just hypnotize me all day long. And I tried it and it really didn't work for me. I felt uncomfortable after her third time insisting. So I, I left and I was really bummed out because I'd worked so freaking hard to get help. And I just decided, you know what? I am a hard worker. I'm going to fix this. All that happened was the drinking got worse and worse, obviously. Um, so I'm trying to do stuff out in public, like trying to volunteer at places where I don't have to see a lot of people. And I'm doing this event down south. Or I'm just helping somebody do something. I don't remember. But I overheard that there, the VA had these satellite um, remote places that can help you. And I, I Googled, there's one right by my house. Um, well, my house is gone the other place I was living. Um, and I called and I'm like, hey, man, I need some help. I need to, I'm a veteran. I need to talk to someone. And they're like, yeah, can you come in at four? And I was like, what for what month? And they're like today. And I was like, oh my God, yes, I can come in at four. So I go in and I'm introduced to a man named Stephen Shore, who's a counselor there. And we get in a room and I've never been in therapy before. I, I didn't know what to expect. And I'm telling him what I told you, but in greater detail. And he's just like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it turns out he was in the army and he'd been through a lot of the same stuff as me. And i am like, finally found somebody I can connect with and he's not drunk and he's not trying to hypnotize me. And um, so I, I looked at him. I remember seeing a man that was married, a man that was trying to adopt a child with his wife and who had a professional career. He was a full human being. And I wanted to be that. I wanted to totally be that. And I was willing to put the work in. And we met so many times for so many years. And he would teach me all these tools. And I, would, I started drinking less. I started getting back into shape. And I started just feeling overall happier in life. And um, some things would still happen, like... Um, I got into ASU. That's part of my life getting better. Um, I mean, I'm going to get a degree. And I was at an art building trying to find where all my classes were going to be. And it was raining outside. And I became convinced that I was being followed by somebody who wanted to harm me. And so I hid in this like darker corridor. And I was like, I got to take this guy out, you know, before he gets me. 
And then Steven's words were kind of in my head and like the stuff we've been working on. And I was like, no, 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 this isn't right. Something's not right here. I'm, I'm imagining this. So I called him on a Saturday. He answered his cell phone. And he's like, dude, that's just some kid looking for his classes too. And I was like, huh, are you sure? <laughs> he's like, yes. And then um, the kid never saw me. He walked by the little area I was hiding in. But as he walked by, I could see his Hello Kitty backpack. And I remember feeling dumb. And he was like, no, no, man. Like you just crossed off a huge item list. Like you realized something was wrong. You're using those tools that we're working on. And I'm like, yes, dude. So, I mean, things aren't perfect now, but I can sit in a restaurant without worrying about the people behind me 90% of the time. Um, and I, I started my own company. I got a degree. I met the most beautiful, amazing human being. Oh, sorry. And I'm, I'm just happy now. The point is, um, there's help out there for everyone. It's not going to fall in your lap. You got to fight your ass off for it and you have to advocate for yourself. And that's life, man. Just get up and do it. Let's go. That's all. Thank you so much for your story, Ryan. Yeah. I almost cried a little bit. I did cry. So even, um, Ryan, thank you so much for telling your story. Thank you for so much for being part of our storytellers community. Um, I want to acknowledge everyone. Um, Ryan obviously is a Navy veteran, but he also, in normal times, prints every single one of our programs for all of our shows across America with his business, Kitchell Printing. So we're grateful that Ryan is um, a longtime supporter and storyteller with our project. Thank I you for your story, Ryan. Thank you, Megan. Awesome. We appreciate you. Um, big deep breath, right? So I'm going to have to do a really straightforward segue. Um, one of the reasons we can bring you Ryan's story and so many powerful stories this evening is because we have the support of our sponsor. Uh, you guys know that Humana sponsors the Storytellers Project nationally and virtually because they believe sharing stories just like these make people healthier and they make for healthier communities. We know that we need these connections right now more than ever to one another, to our health, and as the COVID-19 situation continues to change and evolve all across the country, Humana has repeatedly shown that they are committed to the health, safety, and well-being of their people, their constituents, as well as all of our communities. If you're curious about like literally the jillions of ways that they're making a difference right now, you can visit Humana.com for more about that. Or you can just, you know, appreciate that they're here giving us the resources to bring you shows like this. Our next storyteller is our colleague, Brad Schmidt. We're thrilled to have Brad because his, part of his day job is he works at the Tennessee Inn where he helps support storytellers there as part of his project. But right now, Brad gets to put on his storyteller hat, not his coach hat, and I'll let him take it away. Thanks so much, Megan. I appreciate it. I appreciate everybody who is watching. On February 19th, 2010, 10 years ago, I was leaving a bar with my buddies. We had a great time. Oh my gosh probably four or five Jaeger bombs, fireballs, uh, a bunch of shots that night. And I walked outside, called for a cab, and they told me it was going to be an hour. It was a really busy Friday night. And I was like, Shh, forget that. Got in my car, started it, looked for cigarettes, couldn't find any. So I drove to a gas station, bought cigarettes. The second I pulled out of the gas station, I got pulled over. Damn. This is my second DUI in three years, which would be no surprise to some of the friends who knew me. I was a big drinker. I used, like Ryan, drinking to medicate sometimes. I thought I was just having a good time. I grew up, my dad died when I was a boy and my mom was a, a rager and she was always uh, criticizing and telling us that we were pieces of crap. And I grew up feeling less than. And so food was my first drug of choice. Attention, uh, class clown was number two, and then alcohol and drugs eventually. And that brought me to February 19th, 2010. When those blue lights exploded through my window, I was just like, oh. my boss had already told me if I got a second DUI, I was gonna get fired, which is exactly what happened. I got fired, the judge, thank God, only uh, sent me to jail for a few days and then to rehab, 28 day rehab. 
Well, when I got to rehab, it was after those three days of jail. So I came in with a huge smile on my face, dancing, super happy to be there. Hello, rehab. I mean, just the happiest sober guy who ever showed up there in, in Nashville, Tennessee, at a place called Cumberland Heights. Uh, and the next day, reality set in. And I was like, this is a really nice place. They have nice cabins in the woods, beautiful facilities, all-you-can-eat buffet. But here I am, sentenced to 28 days at rehab, which scared me because I thought I was going to have to take a look at myself. And in fact, that's exactly what happened. Um, I just remember everybody was so stinking nice there. Like, How you doing? Having a good day? Man, let's get into what's bothering you. It looks like something's wrong. Like, I'm happy to help you. I can show you where the dining hall is. Uh, I can help you work on that homework that we got today in group. And I'm like, this place is a freaking cult. And I don't want any part of it. Like, it is really creepy how nice everybody is, and it can't be real. Uh, and, and it turns out that it was. It turns out that folks really were and are into helping each other there. Um, still, I hated the idea that I was an addict or an alcoholic. And so... I would listen to other people's stories that were way more intense than mine. And I'd be like, holy smokes. Like I didn't shoot a needle of heroin in my neck. I didn't steal. I didn't break into my neighbor's house and steal all their stuff. Um, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't. And I kept looking for the differences instead of the similarities. And I thought to myself, this was a serious thought. This is a really nice place for these people. And when I get out of here, I'm going to give money to this place. I mean, I'm going to donate. I mean, that's they do great work. Uh, never thinking that I was one of them. Eventually, in group one day, um, one of the other kids in my group was sharing, I say kid, he was like 20, was sharing that his father died when he was young and the, and the, the counselor stopped him and said, hold on a second, Brad, didn't your da dad die when you were a boy? And I was like, like, None of your business, dude. Like, I was just, I was like, what? And he goes, I want you to get together with the other uh, group member. I don't want y'all to compare notes about your dad's dying and what that feels like to have that loss so early in life. And I'm like, damn, I really thought to myself, that is none of your business. But I did it and it was, I just cried and cried because opening up that box that Ryan talked about I had stuffed all of that grief in the back of my head and it all came out talking to this 20 something year old kid. And uh, after that, I was still resisting the fact that I might be an addict. And there was a guy who came in one day, an alumni who came in to share with, with us, you know, junior recovering people. Uh, his name is Dan. And I had smoked dope with Dan Back in the day, 15, 20 years earlier, had smoked dope with Dan, had drank uh, cases of beer with him. This is a guy who used exactly like I did. And here he is showing up with five years clean. And he like looked incredible. He had some peace about him. He was chill. He physically looked good. He had a job. And his life was together. And I started sobbing in that meeting because two things occurred to me. One, damn it, I am an addict. Because if he's an addict, I'm an addict. And the other reason I got emotional was, and I couldn't have said this then, but because he was so together and he seemed genuinely happy, I think I had my first taste of hope at that rehab center in that meeting with Dan. I was told um, my spirituality, I needed some more spirituality. I needed some advanced work on spirituality. Because for me, God is the person who killed my dad and left me with a really angry mom. And so they, uh, they assigned me to one-on-one -on -one sessions with a pastor there, a very good friend of mine still named Carrie, God bless. And um, she looked at me in the eye at this one-on-one, -on -one, the first one, and says, you know, you're a good person. And I was like, I mean, uh, and she says it again, you know, Brad, you are a good person. And I hang my head 
because I have so much guilt and shame. Oh my God, I got two DUIs in three years. I got fired. I was such a jerk to so many people. I was just so scared, so, so better than everybody else, but afraid that you were going to find out that I was the piece of crap that my mother said that I was for all that time. I, and she says it again, Brad, you are a good person. And I sob as the guilt and shame comes out of me. But again, with a little bit of hope, Carrie showed me, maybe I am a good person. It just cracked the door to that possibility. As I kept going through rehab, I realized there is so much, this is about so much more than drugs, than my cocaine, than the alcohol that I drank. This was about the underlying feeling that I was a piece of crap. This was about my childhood trauma. This was about my dad dying and never dealing with it. This is about never dealing with how I felt about my mom putting me down for all those years. This was about treating what was underlying that. I drank and snorted cocaine. Some of my friends are workaholics. Some of my friends numb out on Netflix. Some of my friends, you know, food, sex, pornography, whatever it is that uh, I use, we use to escape the feelings, those negative feelings about ourselves. And they call it work rehab because it's hard work to confront all the things that I never wanted to face. I never wanted to face my feelings about my mom. I never wanted to face my feelings about my dad. I never wanted to face all the guilt and shame that I had from the things, the bad things I did while I was in active addiction. And rehab finally taught me to have the courage to walk through it. When I left there, I mean, 12 step meetings, 12 step fellowships, therapy, all of, all of the hard work, the work began to really uncover this stuff and to lead me to be a more vulnerable, honest, authentic person, to stop covering everything with a sense of humor or, or chocolate cake or the fifth shot of vodka and to just really deal with what is bothering me and what's behind me. And, to, and when I do that, I can get some real freedom and live in authenticity. Since that time that I left rehab, I mentioned February uh, 19th, 2010. February 20th, 2010 is my clean date, which means I haven't used any drugs or alcohol since then. So I have 10 years clean. And beyond that, I've learned to love myself much more. I've, I mean, don't get me wrong, I can backslide anytime. But I've learned to live in self-acceptance. I've learned to be authentic. I've learned to serve others. I've learned to live outside of myself. I spend a lot of Saturday mornings at food bank distributions. And in the last three years, I, be, <laughs> I can't even believe I'm saying this out loud, I became a foster dad, which means that I'm taking in children usually of active addicts. I'm doing the ultimate service for other folks in recovery and I'm giving their children a safe, loving home until they can pull it together like I did. And it's a beautiful, happy, joyful, frustrating at times, you know, challenging, difficult, but ultimately, ultimately super healing and loving gift that I can give to them and that I can give to me. And I'm super grateful for those 28 days in rehab and the growth that's happened in my life since then. Thank you so much for listening. Oh my gosh, Brad. Thank you so much for your story. And thank you now for so much of your service. I mean, it's like incredibly, it's like mind blowing to think about you as a foster father. Cause I know, no, I'm kidding. Um, but that's remarkable. <laughs> True story. No, Brad, I want to acknowledge, thank you for modeling so much healthy and thoughtful behavior in your story. Time and time again, there were easy choices to make and you made the hard choices that made all the difference. So thank you for that. Thank you so much, Megan. Thank you. Well, you guys, um, we're lucky to have Brad as a colleague and certainly the Storytellers Project in Nashville is so lucky to have him as one of their coaches.
We um, now is the time in our show where we want to start thanking some of our sponsors um, who support the project out in our communities. Because you can know, Storytellers Project exists normally in 22 cities, like in real places you can show up to. And so right now we want to say thank you to Mediacom. Mediacom makes the Storytellers Project happen in Des Moines, and it's a pretty big deal there. Um, more than 1,200 people a night, um, six times a year, come see the Storytellers Project in downtown Des Moines because the good people of Iowa love listening to their neighbors but also because Mediacom helps make that possible. They've supported the project for years. We're incredibly thankful for this because Mediacom is supported to sharing stories and to connecting people through the project, but also through Extreme by Mediacom. And you can see their little logo up in the corner. Um, the speeds are super fast and they wanna make sure that you get everything you need to through your internet connection, even up to a whole gig. So we thank Mediacom for being our partners in this project and for making sure that everyone in their service areas is connected to the people and the things they care about the most. Now I'm excited to welcome up our third storyteller. Joy Young is going to come to us with a story about family and funerals. Take it away, Joy. I spent a year of my childhood um, living with my grandparents when I was growing up with my, my brother and my sister. Um, and by the end of that year, I had decided, and my sister and brother as well, that our grandma was so cool. Um, she stayed up late. Um, she slept all day. She liked to, to sit at the kitchen table drinking um, coffee from Folgers crystals, playing solitaire. And she'd never make you go to bed if you were sitting quiet with her. And when we did go into her bed, it was often to watch movies in one of those hospital beds that move up and down. Um, and next to her bed was always her little um, head mannequin where she kept her wig. Um, I just grew up thinking all old people lost their hair. Um, and my grandma loved to tell stories. She told stories um, late into the night about how she grew up in Missouri and played basketball with boys on the farm. I loved my grandmother. Um, and I loved her even more when as an adult, I found out she'd had cancer when we were living with her um, and just had shown up for us anyway. I loved my grandma so much that after I'd come out to my mom and it hadn't gone well, I know, shock, I came out very surprising, you could see me. Um, <laughs> I was scared to tell her. I couldn't make myself do it. So I did a very adult thing and I just ghosted my grandmother. Um, and it was easy. It is very easy to ghost a person when you don't particularly feel welcome at family events anyway. Um, but it was hard emotionally. Um, and then one 4th of July, I had stopped by my dad's house to see my, my youngest half brother and grandma was just there. And I didn't know what to do because at this point I've been ghosting her for years. Like I was living with my girlfriend, everybody knew, but we had never had a conversation. Um, and my grandma kind of called me over to hug me and all she asked was, how are you and your special friend doing? And like the word special friend is like a little bit weird. And like if it come out of my mom's mouth, like given our history, it would have been a weird feeling. Um, but out of my grandmother's mouth, it was so kind. And I felt so guilty about all the time that we had lost. And for me, having overlooked her capacity for kindness and for me having assumed that somehow because my parents all grew up going to church and my grandparents went to church that everybody who went to church would have the same morality and feelings about how I should live my life. Um, and I spent a long time being angry with myself um, for, for having lost that, that time with her. And I felt even more guilty when on a late October night in Phoenix, Arizona in 2012, my sister called me to tell me that our grandmother had passed away. I just remember it being a hot night and my feet stopped working. My grief was just so heavy, I had to sit on the curb. And as I sat there, my brother called me also um, and begged me to speak at the funeral. Um, 
I was the only one who had gone to college in our family and I was working as a poet. So it made a lot of sense that I should figure out how to say something beautiful about the life of a woman we had both loved so much. But in the days that were leading up to the funeral, I couldn't figure out how to move past all the grief and all of the anger I was feeling about how I'd let the idea that somebody might think my existence was inappropriate stand in the way of living my life in the ways I wanted, like being able to connect with my grandmother. So um, I just kind of avoided the task like I had avoided my grandmother. Um, and I spent the few days following, uh, uh, before the funeral, um, spending most of my time with uh, my nephew, John. Um, I was staying at my sister's house in California and he, he was in kindergarten and he was doing his very first um, performance of a poem for class. So I would stand with him and I'd tell him, okay, John, you're a poet now, I'm a poet, we're gonna do this poem together and we would memorize the poem and spend time doing that. And it felt nice to help him. He was probably my grandmother's favorite person in the universe at that point um, before she had passed. And I didn't get around to writing the poem until really late into the evening, the night before the funeral. And walking in, I was terrified. Um, I knew that there were a lot of people who didn't think I should even set foot in a church in that room in our family, um, let alone walk into a church dressed sort of, sort of like this, but more somber. I should have been in a dress or something more appropriate. And the funeral went kind of without a hitch. It wasn't a particularly good funeral. And I found myself feeling more and more glad that I, I thought I had written something beautiful about her um, because no one else had much to say that I thought felt like her. Um, and even the pastor didn't know her. Her pastor had died several years before. Um, so it was somebody who had never even met her while she was alive um, speaking about her. And then I went and everything was okay. Um, I was still kind of nervous. I still hadn't really processed everything that had happened. And I still wanted to get out of there. I hadn't really thought about everything that had happened. I definitely felt like I hadn't processed anything at all. And that's when the pastor um, said that thing they say at the end of almost every funeral, where they're like, well, now is the time. If anyone else has something to say, this is it. And in the back of the church, sitting with my, my brother, um, my nephew raises his hand really fast. Um, and my sister, who was his mom, sitting closer up to the front, turned around and saw and shot him one of those mom looks that makes the hand go right down. So he didn't go up. And then the pastor keeps talking. And we circle back around to him saying, okay, this is really it. This is the last time. And this time, John doesn't raise his hand. He just gets up and starts walking down the center aisle. And I feel everything turn to slow motion as my sister turns around to say, John, Jaycott, no! And my nephew in all his like five year old glory with like his high water pants and his like clip on tie that's like half off of his button up shirt at this point turns and gives her a double thumbs up. And then he finishes walking down the aisle and he gets up to the podium and the pastor picks him up. And that's like when he realizes there's an audience and he panics for just a second. But the panic takes just long enough that you felt all the energy in the room shift. And you could feel that collectively we were all thinking, oh my God, this is gonna be like one of those moments in a movie where we're all like out of the mouths of babes come the best wisdom. But then he performed the only poem he knows. And it goes like this. I went out with a mummy and a ghost that glowed at night. 
I went out with a skeleton that shone a spooky light. I went out with a mummy that likes to gasp and mo moan on Halloween. I never want to trick or treat alone. And he is like spitting distance from my grandmother's casket. And I felt a tiny tinge of guilt because I think in his five-year-old brain, he thought like we've spent days talking about how we're both poets and now Aunt Joy has done a poem. So clearly it's my turn to do my poem. But the guilt was not bigger than the absurdity. So I just started laughing and the laugh turned into a hysterical laugh and the hysterical laugh turned into a crying hysterical laugh. And I looked over and my sister was a laugh crying too. But like not everybody in the church was laugh crying, but I didn't really care. John and me and my sister, we were some of my grandma's favorite people. And I kind of think she would have been proud, not just of our poems, but of our lives, of how we chose to live them of how we had shown up for each other, even in weird and unexpected ways. I was sure that she would have been proud of how we were living our lives, whether or not anyone else thought we were being inappropriate. Thank you, Joy, for your story. Thank you for introducing us to your gra your grandmother and so many of your family members. I really appreciate the idea of such a sense of humor and like so much, I don't know, like such a rolling with it moment in the middle of a funeral, like God bless. <laughs> Thanks. Your, do you tell your nephew now, like does he know he's famous for that moment in your family's legends? You know, I don't, but I think he might be watching so, and I don't know if he remembers it, um, but yeah, and I bet he doesn't remember that poem, but no. I will never ever have that poem etched in my brain. In your brain. And now I have a new Halloween poem too. Joy, thank you for your poetry. Thank you for your story. Thank you so much for introducing us to your beautiful grandmother. Thank you. Awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, I am excited to welcome up our fourth storyteller. Manny Sepulveda is coming to us out of the awesomeness of our brother, our brother and sister paper, The Desert Sun in Palm Springs. He's one of, um, you guys know these nights are supported by our journalism brothers and sisters all across the country. Um, we have people from the Nashville, Tennessean who supported this night, the Arizona Republic. And like I said, Manny's here because of our coaches and colleagues at The Desert Sun. So with that, Manny, thank you so much for volunteering to share your story and being a part of tonight's show. Thank you, Megan. And thank you for allowing us to come into your homes and tell your stories. My story starts in 1954. I'm nine years old, standing in front of my third grade class, holding a green banana and a yellow banana. I'm doing my very first show and tell. I'm going to tell my classmates how bananas are grown, but I'm paralyzed. Not a word comes out of my mouth and I wet myself. The classroom is so quiet, I can hear the tick, tick, tick of the clock on the wall. I want to run out and go back to where I came from. I was born on an isolated mountainous region of Puerto Rico on a coffee and banana plantation. In 1953, a year earlier, my parents, with a couple of suitcases and an abundance of hopes and dreams, came to Los Angeles. I remember I would miss my horse and the creek downhill from where I lived, where I would go sit and watch the waters gently crash against the rocks. But I will never forget the troubles I had adjusting to a culture and an environment so different than the one I, I came from and a language I had never even heard. I'm an American, but this is a different America. In this America, everywhere I look, I see people, houses, concrete sidewalks, paved roads, and lots of cars. We have neighbors next door. There are street lamps that help illuminate the night. I pull a spring on a bulb and the light comes on. There's running water inside the house. 
my mom does laundry inside the house and she no longer cooks in a wood burning stove. And there's a small room where you do your personal business and can take a bath. And you can talk to someone not standing next to you by telephone. And there is a box with moving pictures and another one with music. And my mom and my sisters teach me how to, how to dance salsa. And I come to later find out that even in my new America, learning how to dance salsa is a Puerto Rican birthright. In Puerto Rico, we lived in a comfortable shack made of wood on a cement slab and a tin roof. We had no electricity. We got our water with a bucket from the river and had an outhouse for our personal business. We went to the river to bathe and to do laundry. And unless someone was standing next to you, you weren't talking to them. Our nearest neighbor, about a mile away. And unless you played guitar, there was no music. And the landscape was lush green, untamed and beautiful. And the night sky illuminated by a million stars dancing in the sky in your home by gas lanterns or candles. In this America, my family went to a supermarket to buy food. In Puerto Rico, we grew most of our own food. We had cows and pigs and so many chickens. We grew our own vegetables and fruits. My one constant, rice and beans for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and dessert. Oh. And then there was Christmas. In Puerto Rico, Christmas is celebrated on January 6th, and it's called El Dia de los Tres Reyes, the Day of the Three Kings, the Three Wise Men. On the evening of the 5th, you put out your shoe or a shoe box filled with hay and a bowl of water for the camels. So imagine my surprise when I found out in this country, you leave milk and cookies for someone named Santa and my delight to further find out that Santa is a jolly old man in a red suit and a white beard who brings gifts to every boy and girl. I couldn't believe my luck. I embraced all these changes, but the change that gave me the most trouble for several years was the language. I would have trouble with English. English is difficult to learn as a second language and it is a boring subject. There is nothing sexy about nouns, pronouns, and verbs. Its rules are confusing. The first time I heard I before E except after C, I wanted to scream. And I still do not understand dangling participles. And I'm betting you don't either. In the 1950s, there was no bilingual education. The only help I have received it's from a classmate, the teacher asked to sit in a corner with me and teach me the alphabet and numbers. No one in my house speaks English. So I live in two worlds, my English world nine to three and my, and my Spanish world three to the following morning. So I'm standing there in front of my classmates in soil pants. My teacher says, it's okay. I take my seat, my head bowed, and when the bell rings, I run home. I don't say a thing to anyone, but my mom senses something is wrong. She asks, estas bien? Are you okay? I am so embarrassed. I don't want to tell my mom the truth, but I can't lie. We have rules. And rule number one, you do not disrespect or lie to your parents, and if you do, Dios te castiga. God will punish you. But I think for a brief moment, my mom did not ask the right question. She did not ask, did something happen? So I reply, estoy bien. I'm okay. Estoy cansado. The next morning, estoy cansado. I'm tired. The next morning, I don't want to go to school. I tell my mom, uh, I don't feel quite right. My mom has a cure for every affliction, her version of chicken soup. It's a tea made from an herb and it tastes awful. And she threatens to make it for me. I go to school. 
the teacher says he understands my embarrassment and my problems. And he gives me this piece of advice. He says, I cannot change my circumstances. So I must change my behavior. I do not remember the last time that I raised my hand in class even to ask to go to the restroom. Being called on terrifies me. Reading out loud is embarrassing. I walk home alone. I eat lunch alone. Teacher says I must reach out to my classmates and he gives me a continuing homework assignment. He says every Friday I must turn in a story about a classmate I got to know. My first three stories are on boy classmates. And with every story I write, I make a friend. But here, my teacher changes the assignment. He says, I must alternate boy, girl. So I find myself with no choice. I had to talk to girls. And I start to find out that girls are so much more fun than boys. But I also realize that most of my learning must be done outside of school. And I make myself a promise and I give myself a dream. I am going to learn this language as quickly as I can. And I see myself not only speaking in front of my classmates, but in front of the whole school. And I bury myself reading picture books and children books the sports pages, and comic books. I spend countless hours in front of a mirror practicing my speech. My teacher has given me a pocket-sized bilingual dictionary, and I carry it with me wherever I go, like Linus carrying his blanket. And I watch a lot of TV, particularly I Love Lucy, and I want to be Ricky Ricardo without the accent. And as you can tell, I nailed that one. And I follow my mom around the house, speaking Spanish, translating it into English, until my mom gets tired of my chatter. And she tells me to go out and play and come back in when the streetlights come on. And today, my wife, Tony, when she gets tired of my chatter, which is often, she asks me to go out and do something and come back in when dinner's ready. Just about the same thing. The school year is coming to an end. The teacher gives me one final assignment. He says, I must redo my show and tell. And when I'm finished, he puts his arms around my shoulders and says, Manuel, I see you speaking at your high school graduation. And nine years later, as I walk to the podium to give my high school graduation speech for a brief moment, I am nine years old again in third grade, listening to my teacher, Mr. Markshanov, who planted the seed. In 2013, I last visited Puerto Rico, that humble village where I first saw life. My heart full of love and gratitude love for my birthplace and gratitude for that one day 60 years earlier that brought me to this country my surroundings no longer familiar but my memories were my horse the creek down hills from where i lived chasing chickens fetching water but another memory always lingers in my mind my show and tell it was a moment in my life that changed my behavior and consequently the person I would become. You see, a kind and wise teacher gave me a path to follow, but my failure gave me motivation and I have always, always used the fear of failure as as as, a, as personal motivation. I have lived a wonderful and lucky life. I have lived 
my parents' hopes and dreams. And I can't believe that peeing in my pants had that kind of impact. Buenas noches, good night, take care of yourselves. Oh my God, Manny, thank you so much for your story. And thank you for the big finish. <laughs> I really, I really appreciate your sense of humor. And oh my gosh, thank you so much. Hey, do you remember the name of your teacher? Mr. Mark Shinoff, I think it was Russian. And actually, I think one of the reasons he understood and had empathy with what I went through was because he had gone through the same thing when he came to this country. Awesome, Manny, thank you for your story. And thank you for introducing us to such a thoughtful and loving teacher who changed your life and got you a bunch of new friends. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you. I'm excited to bring up our last storyteller, Jack Flores. Jack, um, I'm so excited to have you. He is our youngest storyteller ever. And um, we are thrilled that he and his family has agreed, um, have agreed to join us tonight um, from their house in Phoenix. So Jack, take it away. Thanks for being here. You're welcome. Uh, like all teenage boys, I sometimes get annoyed with my brother and parents, but I still love them. But I'm also very different from other teenage boys. I was supposed to be born in November, but I was born I was supposed to be born in November, but I was born 12 weeks before that in September instead. Being born premature creates lots of different problems for different people. Many premature babies don't make it out of the hospital. Many have tons of surgeries and procedures to help them live. For me, it resulted in cerebral palsy. Cerebral palsy, or CP for short, is caused by damage to the developing brain that usually affects movement, muscle tone, and posture. A lot of people with CP use wheelchairs because they can't walk. Others have a hard time talking. It can affect everyone differently. The doctors worry that I wouldn't be able to walk, and if I did, it would be with a walker. My papa likes to call me his miracle boy. I'm not sure if that's true, but I am walking and even running. Um, I don't run or walk like other kids. They are much faster than me. So in my feet and my leg muscles are very tight. So my feet, ankles and legs aren't the best. And I've had to wear a different leg and foot braces throughout my life. Uh, I have a tough time with fine motor skills as well. Easy things that others take for granted are challenging for me, such as tying my shoes, riding, brushing my teeth and combing my hair, just to name a few. I first realized I was different when I went to the third grade at Anthem School. We would warm up for PE by playing tag before moving on to whatever coach I had planned for that day. We were playing tag in the gym and a kid tagged me out, so I moved on to some other exercises. As I was doing some mountain climbers and watching other kids play, I realized they were all much faster than me. It was kind of like when Peter Parker starts walking on walls and realizes he's Spider-Man. I realized in that moment that I am different. I was a little sad at that because I didn't ask to be different. I wanted to fit in and be like all the other kids. I didn't let that define me. So I moved on and decided to not let it bother me. Uh, because of my CP, I started therapy pretty early in my life. Pretty much as soon as I got home from the hospital, I've had therapy. There are two types of therapy for me. The first is occupational therapy or OT, where they teach you skills that help uh, that help you in your daily life. The second is physical therapy or PT, where they teach you skills that help you physically and make you stronger. I've worked with a lot of different therapists in my life. Many of them have become. They've helped me learn to tie my shoes. They've helped me learn to button shirts and even put them on differently to make it easier for me. They've even helped me learn to use utensils better. It wasn't without challenges and frustrations, though. I love to eat. I am a teenage boy, after all. But using utensils is just not easy for me. Some foods are especially challenging. One of these foods for me is green paints. I was eating dinner one night, and like all good parents, my parents threw vegetables on the side. Tonight's vegetable, green beans. I tried stabbing them, but they wouldn't stay in the fork. I tried scooping them, but they just fell off. 
Finally, my frustration reached the boiling point, and I uttered the mother of all curse words of these beans. F in green beans? <laughs> Unfortunately, I said the real F word there. It wasn't my proudest moment, and my mom granted me for a week. But I was reminded that cursing at my situation and feeling sorry for myself wasn't going to make a difference. I should keep trying and working, and that was what would make the difference. Last summer, I went on an 18-mile backpacking trip. My dad was there to help me through the literal highs and lows of hiking and carrying 25 pounds of gear on my back. There were points where all the terrain would be flat and they were pretty woods to look at. There were other times where we were walking in and out on narrow canyon trails with steep drops to one side. And if I tripped, I had a pretty good chance of falling down the canyon walls. <coughs> um, in fact, only a few steps into the trip, I fell down. Fortunately, it wasn't in a canyon, but in some tall grass, so I didn't get hurt. And my dad and others were ready to help me up. After the first day on the trail, my feet were really hurting. After sleeping and getting back on the trail the next day, my dad shared a scripture with me. Here's another thing that makes me different. I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We have some extra commandments that we follow called the Word of Wisdom. It teaches us not to smoke, drink alcohol, or take other things into our bodies that would harm them. While I was struggling on our hike, the scripture my dad quoted to me was the promise that the Lord gives for keeping the word of wisdom. It says, All saints who remember to keep and do these things shall run and not be weary, and shall walk and not faint. I knew that I was living the word of wisdom and that the Lord keep his promise to me and help me to keep walking. I just had to keep going. And he did. I finished that hike without falling again and still hike to this day. If you can imagine that hiking and walking is hard for me, then you think running would be harder. And you're right, running is hard. I've been running on my school's cross country team for three years and it hasn't always been easy. There was the bloody knee incident where my dad and I were running one morning and I tripped on the uneven pavement and went down. My knee was bleeding pretty bad. So my dad helped me get to the park to get cleaned up and get home. I tripped several times during practice, but the other kids were always there to make sure I was okay and encouraged me to keep going. I even got lost one time while running through a community park during a practice. Thankfully, my coach found me and was able to help me find my way back. And this is all just during practice. As I mentioned earlier, I don't run like other kids and I'm pretty slow. When race days came, I knew I wouldn't be one of the fastest, but if the tortoise beat the hare, then maybe I could win too. Well, I never did beat the hare, but I never quit. Even though other kids would walk when they were tired, I never did. I ran the whole time, every race. Of course, having my mom there and treating me on helped a lot as well. Living with CP has taught me that everyone has challenges. I've had plenty of challenge, ch challenges in my life and I'm sure I'll have plenty more. I want to serve a mission for my church. Many missionaries ride bikes. I don't. I'll have to figure that one out. They have cars, so I don't really have to worry too much. Um, but. Uh, I want to get married and have a family. I want to have a good job to for, to provide for my family. All, all of, Some of these things might not be all that easy for me, and I don't know what life will bring me next, but I plan on making lemonade on any lemons of my life, and I leave life wondering how I did it. From the immortal word of Spider-Gwen, from Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse. No matter how many times you get knocked down, can you get back up? I can, and I will. Thank you. Jack, thank you. Thank you so much for your story. You did so great. Thank you. We're so lucky to have you. Oh, man. Jack, thank you so much. Well, listen, I want to bring up all of our storytellers to say hi real quick, you guys. Um, thank you all so much. Joy, Jack, Manny, Brad, and Ryan. Thank you so much for your stories tonight. We appreciate you all so much. Everyone who's out there watching, thank you for being part of our show. If you liked this, you can watch more stories at the Storytellers Project at just storytellersproject.com. We're going to be doing this twice a month through the rest of the year. And even then after that, we'll do it once a month in 2021 because of you guys' is like outrageous response to the shows. So thank you so, so much for watching. Please find out more about us on Instagram or Twitter, or again, visit our website. Um, tune in in two weeks on the 25th when we have another, um, shoot, what is our storytelling show about then? You guys, I literally forget. We're doing a lot of these right now. I'm really sorry. Our next storytelling show though is on the 25th 
and we'll be excited to see you there. Thank you so much for watching.